A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. Welcome, everybody. We're here with uh, Aditya uh, Deshbandu, uh, lecturer of communications uh, in uh, digital uh, media sociology at the University of Exeter, uh, a researcher of video game studies, new media, and the digital divide. Aditya examines how people engage with digital artifacts and seeks to understand how these interactions shape everyday lives. As someone who actively examines uh, digital acts of leisure, which uh, obviously video games are digital acts, uh, digital acts of leisure, uh, Aditya's <laughs> research in the last decade has examined social media and OTT platforms alongside video games and digital cultures. Uh, he's also the author of uh, Gaming Cultures in India, Digital Play in Everyday Life, and the forthcoming The 21st Century in 100 Games. Uh, Aditya Deshbandu, welcome to the show. Yeah! Woo! Thank you, Shlomo. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that enthusiastic announcement. Yeah. Really nice uh, to be here. <laughs> All right, glad to have you. Uh, Andy is not with us today. He had some technical problems getting in, so uh, I'm going solo. And uh, I hope the uh, I want to say the ghost of Andy, but the spirit of Andy, not the ghost of Andy. Right? Uh, will 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 remain with us. So uh, we're uh, we're talking here about how uh, game companies and gaming communities really uh, treat mm -hmm. the global south. Uh, before uh, before we started, you and I actually were talking about. The idea of the global south and why we use the the term global south. Uh, it seems like a really good place to start here, right? So, what is the global south? Uh, how does it differ from the global no north? Who's in? Who's out? How should we think about this? Okay, um, I think as most of you would kind of guess, right? It started off with the geographical location, the north and the south originally, uh, right? So, uh, all the countries uh, that were colonial powers. Uh, which went on to become the first world, I mean, in that brief uh, Cold War period. Um, they were all further north. And uh, the other countries were closer to the equator, uh, or south of the equator. So that held for a while, till, you know, uh, people in New Zealand, Australia, um, and those developed nations began to realize, hey, we are technically not part of the global south. Right? Uh, then uh, they began to find numerous um, terms that could replace the global south but i mean if you look at it from a flow of wealth kind of understanding and how uh, most of capitalism looks at money trickling down then the global north becomes the countries which have the highest amount of resources the latest in technological development and stuff like that uh, and from them knowledge information money resources is supposedly trickling down to nations in the global south who are trying to find out their own you know, uh, trajectories to development and, yeah, trying to get there, right? So the global north then becomes kind of like an aspirational rather than a geographical location for mm. nations. Okay, so, yeah. okay, aspirationally, people want to move from the global south to the global north. Um, Correct, so the countries ooh, themselves ooh. probably right. want to get developed and become global north countries themselves. People wanting to move. Of course, yeah, for better careers, livelihoods also as well, yeah. Okay, um, okay, so let's talk <laughs> gaming. Uh, how does gaming differ in the global oh, south uh, from uh, gaming places like uh, Europe, mm. Korea, uh, the US? Mm. So, uh, Aditya? so, first and foremost, right, so if you consider, if you look at video games and the devices that make games happen, oh. right, uh, it is, yeah, uh, it is important to acknowledge that all of these are pieces of technology, right? And technology itself is not exactly neutral per se, right? So technology comes to different countries at different times. Correct? I mean, the best such example was uh, even to look at something like the PlayStation 5, right? Over the last two, two and a half years, right? To see which countries it went on sale at what times, mm -hmm. kind of told you which countries uh, were being relied upon as markets, um, which countries uh, probably had access to, uh, you know, the latest console architecture before other countries did. Um, and correct, so depending on availability, which markets were considered to be important enough. So that gives you one kind of an idea. Similarly, um, 
you know, uh, a lot of gaming companies kind of realize, they calculate where is it that their markets are, where is it that people can afford even their kind of hardware or technology, right? So uh, uh, gaming in the global south is kind of like a spectrum. It begins with almost no gaming. Correct? To people who just cannot afford devices to play games, who have never thought of video games, correct? Uh, to, you know, uh, people who probably have access to the same tech as anybody else, you know, in a global north nation like the United States or the UK, right? So, because gaming becomes, if you think about it, uh, almost like uh, a, a showcase of your uh, financial capability, an right. act of privilege right. of sorts, right? So, uh, the fact that uh, you can afford all the basic necessities, then you can afford uh, to have a good livelihood, and then afford to get most of these devices imported because they're not manufactured in your country, they're not, the patents are not being filed in your country, correct? And pay those over and beyond charges beyond the, uh, the list price, right? Because you're paying heavily on customs, you're paying heavily on, um, you know, shipping and all of that, and then get into something like this. So you kind of realize, right? So, yeah. Can, 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 can we talk about probably... the... the... Uh, sorry, Aditi, can we talk about hmm. the PS5 example that oh. you mentioned? Because that, that does sound really yeah. interesting. So uh, the PS5 hmm. comes out, there's a huge demand for it. Uh, where does it go? Oh, yeah. So for the first... Or, or where, uh, or where let, doesn't let, it go, <laughs> I guess, is the question. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So for the, first, uh, for the first six months, at least, the only uh, places in the world that had availability of a PS5, despite its incredible shortage, were the US, um, UK, and Europe. These were the mm. only three areas they were focusing on. Because they knew that even before it would go on sale, each and every piece was probably sold out. Correct? So you had this uh, aligned network of websites and portals and all of those monitoring where people could pre-reserve a PS5 even before it was manufactured on the assembly line. Back then. Correct? Okay. So which right. meant, um, uh, so if you look at it, which meant looking at countries like India and China and, um, you know, even countries uh, um, like Nigeria or Ghana or any of them uh, in Africa um, um, did not have access to the PlayStation. So it is so bad, I'll tell you. Um, this is uh, 2019 when the PlayStation's first kind of announced, 2020 when it launches, Okay. right, uh, the PS5. Um, uh, and it's also the time the pandemic's hitting. Right, right. right. So, uh, in the Indian context where I come from, where I was at the time, uh, they kind of uh, announced that the PlayStation 5 would uh, launch at the same time as everywhere else globally. But this was before they knew of the semiconductor shortage. Mm, right? And okay. then the semiconductor shortage happens. And they realize we have to prioritize where we make the most money. Right? And where it's the easiest to do business. Right? So, once these priorities happen, um, so... Uh, we were following up with Sony. We were trying to find out launch dates for India. We were told we may not be able to do the launch window, but you should have it by the end of 2021. Okay. By and the end of 2021. Like, okay, that sounds okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. So December 2021. But again, the silicon shortage was still on. It was also holiday season, rest of the world. Right. Uh, the uh, 2021 window never really happened. Okay. okay. Um, uh, and we pushed on and it kept on uh, moving that way. And we kept trying to chase things, trying to figure out what's happening, how things are happening. Right. Uh, and I believe the few times the PlayStation 5 dropped in India, it dropped in ridiculously no, low numbers. Okay. It was dropping, say, um, I mean, the first batch of PlayStations they had, Indian media reports was at about 4,000 devices. Okay. And you just need to look at the number of PlayStation 4s they had sold in the previous generation and how mm. they kept selling them continuously and how it was an extremely popular device, right? To realize that that number was nowhere close to meeting the demand that the nation had. Okay. And the flash sales kept on happening. And, you know, you would find inventory sell out in a matter of seconds, right? It was also happening globally. But uh, at least globally, you know, the supply wasn't being capped. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, in India, for example, you would never have a higher number of devices. And 
it would always sell, which would only create further demand. And this is not limited just to the PlayStation 5, right? I mean, you couldn't get the Series X anywhere, um, you could, uh, the Xbox uh, console anywhere. The Switch was nowhere to be found. Uh, none of these were uh, there anywhere. But that's also because historically you have prioritized a specific set of nations, a specific set of markets over other kinds of nations. Uh, we were trying to reach out to Sony India to figure out what's happening, only to realize that, you know, uh, PlayStation did not have an India dedicated team. Oh, wow. Right? So, so they had a Middle East. Uh, yeah, 1.4 billion people as a market, but not a team dedicated to sell it there. So they were, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were using the same team as uh, the team for Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, and they were kind of telling, you know, it's the same kind of team. Please go ahead with that, right? So, which meant that we had no idea, or no information for that matter, for where devices were, when devices were coming, where were they going to be sold, how they were going to be sold, and of course, let's not even forget scalping and other things, right? Right, right, so, right, right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, because those are the days, right? I mean, right, right. Yeah. and and that's and that's all hardware, right? Um, let's, uh, yeah. and I'm sure software software has its own stories and all that, um, <laughs> and we'll probably get into yeah. some of that. So let, let's talk about how people yeah. play, right? So we're talking uh, people in the global south <laughs> tend to have significantly less money. Uh, how does that affect uh, what and how they play? And obviously, we already got one thing. Uh, out in the air, uh, which is the consoles available to them uh, are, you know, themselves different based on the choices that uh, the producers are making about who to sell to. What so? What about the playing itself? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so the kind of play that happens also changes significantly, right? So at least, uh, so for example, growing up, um, 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 factor in this, Shlomo, uh, that. Nintendo has never sold uh, any of its hardware in India. It has Why? categorically never sold because it doesn't consider it to be a uh, uh, beneficial enough market. Mm. So you, the Switch never came. The Game Boys never came. Uh, and no version of the Game Boy Advance or you know the SP or any of them ever made it there. Right, uh, the right. Wii was never there. Correct. So you understand it. Right? So but it's not like that the devices never sold in India or the games never sold. Correct? Um, so, um, even today, if I were to go to the Nintendo website to try and buy a game, right? I mean, we are all going, I mean, we are recording this uh, about four days before Tears of the Kingdom, right? Legend of Zelda. And we are all getting ready for it and gearing up for it. Um, there's no way to buy a game from the Nintendo store for a Switch that's probably operational in India. If you really? claim that you are in India, Mm. Right? Uh, you have to. So, for example, my switch says my location is somewhere in the US. Uh, okay. <laughs> I put in one of those zip codes from the US okay. and it lets me download the games. And no questions asked. Right? So, almost like these particular regions don't exist. Correct? Okay? Because they never focused on that. They were never considered to be viable enough. Right? And it's the same thing you extend to a lot of other games as well. Right? So, now it's beginning to get easier. But for a long time, it was very, very difficult to find games on launch days or even to know that you could buy stuff off. Correct? Luckily, uh, we are now moving towards digital uh, stores, right? I mean, you buy a game and it downloads directly down and as long as you have the internet, it doesn't matter where you are, right? Uh, so things are getting easier. Uh, but again, uh, even to be able to pay for games, you know, in India's currency, the rupee, uh, right. came a lot later. It was not something we were able to do right from the first stage. So um, for a lot of games, we used to pay in uh, dollars, then uh, get killed by the conversion, right? Because our incomes are never going to be as, uh, I mean, in terms of absolute conversion, as good as, you know, the income in the US or in Europe or in the UK. Uh, plus then pay for transaction charges because these, all of these are international transactions, right? Oh, uh, so, wow. Okay. Is this? Yep. I'm assuming this is a this is a uh, a big deal for uh, anyone paying almost anywhere in the global south. So if you're in a, you know, uh, let's say U Uganda, um, you know, you yep. have your own local currency. Hopefully, they make it available in your local currency. So do developers have to develop something different for 
every currency or is it essentially there's some sort of automatic th automated thing that will take your local currency and either accept it or turn it into dollars no i think it needs some sort of a partnership shlomo where you okay. uh, partner with the local banks in the country correct so uh, that way once you've partnered in so you pay even in your local currency while the payment to the developer comes in the currency in which they are incorporated right mm. so for example if you take something like cd project red and you were to buy something like witcher right irrespective of where in the world you buy the witcher from cd project would receive their money in euros or in whatever currency they are used to right um uh, the rest of the world would pay whatever is the fair price correct and this would get rid of the transaction fee and the uh, uh conversion fee and stuff like that which would make it safe and more open for business correct but again you are willing to go to these lengths to explore these possibilities if you think it's profitable for you in terms of the number of transactions mm. right if cd right. project were to sell maybe 10 copies of witcher 3 in uganda right why would they even bother exploring that possibility Um now I'm assuming that the the situation is different with mobile phones because unlike any oh, of these yeah. console games mobile phones are going to be both cheaper and a lot more common is 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 is, is that right Absolutely So yeah. it, uh, the Android revolution has been huge right I mean um uh, especially if you look at it in India and China uh, most of Southeast Asia uh the way android uh, as an ecosystem has kind of succeeded is huge so you get high powered um uh, mobile phones for really low prices affordable prices right so uh, so acquiring the hardware is not really as difficult as it used to be because you want to sell smartphones you want to sell uh, the ecosystem you want to bundle all of these as services or technologies of life right i mean if you look at the arguments that meta and uh, social media platforms are trying to make right. right so selling mobile phones at you know at razor thin profit margins is something they want to do and it also helps the governments that are in these countries because uh, having people connected also means you are able to trace them you are able to then charge uh, have accountability systems for taxes and stuff right because a mm. lot of e governance is now linked to your phones right, right? so it's opened up all of these opportunities so this plus the fact that mobile as an ecosystem has such a thriving free to play economy right. uh, for video games uh, means that you just need to pay for the device because not only should i uh, in the case of consoles not only should i go through all the expenses to buy a console i then also need to find really uh, ingenious ways to afford games as well right so uh, that doesn't really have to happen with mobile phones right because there's enough of a free to play ecosystem i play the game i like it okay i keep playing if not i move on right and there's always an endless supply of games kind of right so that's something that's really taken off in uh, the global south i think india has probably one of the largest playing bases in the world for mobile games especially battle royale right so uh, when you see a game like pubg get banned and then you see billions be shaved off 10 cents market valuation that tells you the size of uh, you know a country's gaming base and power base and you know right, how right. it kind of expands right so yeah so these are really interesting dimensions to think of and i think mobile is in a lot of way with regards to video games kind of democratizing that space it's leveling things out so um i mean uh if we were to think of video games as a space to have fun and you know get into some sort of competitive play um a player of fortnite on a you know on a 100 dollar smartphone uh probably is going to have a very close experience to somebody who's playing it on a 1000 dollar iphone pro correct and, really uh, the the, the right, difference is and, that small i mean well, because they optimize all of it anyway right I see. Right. Okay. So it's all optimized. Yeah. What what about the this, what about what about bandwidth? Uh does bandwidth may make a difference? Is there sufficient bandwidth? Yeah. So mm. that's something I guess uh, especially India has been a little lucky with. I don't know how though. Uh there was this uh um uh, I mean there was this entrant in the Indian mobile market who decided to give data um who decided to give 4G data for free for the first okay. 6 months 
Okay. okay. And when they did that, they built a user base, the kind of we have never seen, right? They went from a company or a cellular mobile service with no subscribers to probably the second largest user base in the country. And as they did that, they played a battle of attrition to the point that uh, data is kind of being given away to people in India at throwaway mm-hmm. prices. I guess it's one of the cheapest data markets in the world, right? So, um, um, and I think that's something that's kind of worked out, right? But uh, I don't know how long it'll hold for, right? That honeymoon period, right? Uh, how long will the economics make sense? I do not know. And but, this is just uh, India. This is something right. that's happening. Data is, yep, right. so, this is just India. Other so countries, we, not so much. Right. That's so, the, I mean, we, we still have all of Africa. We still have South America, right? We have, you know, those speeds seem to be yep. pretty damn good in China for, for the most part. Um, I, is Do you know yeah. anything about uh, whether, you know, because you're talking about the democratization, right? And this is part of the key of all this, right? That you're, you're now putting mm-hmm. players uh, on the level playing field. Uh, do you know if, if um, how much of that is yeah. happening worldwide? Uh, with uh, mobile-based games, we are, they, I think we are beginning to see uh, um, entry of people into games like never before, right? So, uh, I mean, if we uh, look at the latest market reports for, from firms like NewZoo and stuff who do this kind of market research, uh, they claim that uh, I think four in every seven people, uh, four of every seven people in the world now play video games. So, I don't know if a number of this kind could have existed, say, 10 years ago or 15 mm. years ago, right? So, we are seeing that expansion kind of happen. However, is this expansion uniform across the world? Is I do, Again, I don't think uh, possible, right? Uh, what is happening, if you think of it, Shlomo, is that you have identified, and when I say you, I mean um, the tech companies and the gaming companies and the data pro- provision companies have identified what they call the next billion. The next mm-hmm. billion people they want to give access in, uh, to internet right. and bring into the fold of tech. Right? right, right. And this next billion uh, lives in India and China, which means uh, India and China are going to get the pick of the uh, tech development, are going to get the most affordable prices for stuff, correct? And all of the West's uh, financial resources will pump money into uh, uh, the ecosystems of you know innovation happening in these countries because right. you need to maximize your user base, right? Right, so, right. Uh, all of this is happening at a cost in itself. Does this extend to, say, a country like Guyana in the West Indies? I don't think so. Mm. Right? But again, none of those countries can offer probably 300 million users of a new Battle Royale game. Right. right? So, right. Uh, correct. So, is this a democratization on the ideal uh, sense? Probably not. Is it a majoritarian leveling of the field? Probably yes. Because you're eyeing new kinds of markets. You're looking at video games uh, not from a you know, uh, revenue maximization angle, but you're looking at it as a bottom of the pyramid kind of understanding, right? So can I eke out every last penny from... So if I get people... To... So if you think of something like the Battle Pass, right? And that is something we are going to discuss today as well. Right, right, right. right. Uh, instead of getting people to pay $60 for, for a game and probably sell it to 10,000 people in a country like India, can I get probably... 5 million people to pay me $1 and probably is that more than (laughs) in terms of revenue, right? So, uh, and can I get them to pay that every month on a repeat by repeat basis, right? Almost like a subscription fee. How do we then kind of think of that? So, yeah. Um, Yeah, so I think uh, very, very complex uh, angle and very difficult to understand the ethics of something like this, right? So, uh, sure. It's just, you know, the, the size of all this, right? I mean, you've got, yeah. you know, 200 countries with different economies, different governments, different needs. You have, uh, marketing people and distribution people from game companies that are, you know, that can only focus on so much, Absolutely. right? You have people with lots of, in lots and lots of different situations. You know, I, I want to bring this kind of into our next, uh, the next issue, uh, mm-hmm. because uh, in, in an early episode, we talked about pirating. And mm-hmm. traditionally, there's, you know, one way of kind of dealing with this, uh, 
uh, <laughs> issue has been uh, pirating, right? I mean, used to in the global south, there used to be pirating of everything, not just video games, but really everything. Uh, is this still the case? Um, you know, especially given how mobile has really changed. Uh, are there special sorts of black or gray market tailors for uh, tailored for gamers in the global south? Uh, see, uh, extremely interesting question, Shukromo. Uh, so in my first book, when I was trying to map out the cultures of gaming in India, uh, this was something I absolutely encountered. And I went to a couple of these uh, supposed gray markets in uh, the biggest cities, right? In Delhi, in Bombay, in Hyderabad, in Bangalore. I was looking at where, how these uh, economies of pirated games kind of work. How, uh, I, I mean, I called it the cracking economy. I know, not very okay. original. But, you know, that's what sure, it was. Sure. Right? The, uh, right. Yeah, and there is a global system to how games get cracked and how they're distributed. And you think of it from torrents and um, peer-to-peer -peer sharing and all of those networks, right? And you begin to realize how um, probably at that period of time, the most that mattered to a gamer in a context like India or in any global South nation that did not have a strict uh, policy against piracy right, okay, right. Uh, was to make sure you have a good enough uh, computer to play games right. and a, a really fast enough internet. And any game you wanted was available to you probably on launch day. Okay, okay. on launch day, um, okay. So, right. Yep, so yeah. um, I'll tell you. Uh, so I had participants in my study uh, who told me, and the, this is 2013, 2014, right? Okay. So uh, if you remember, UBI Soft had this game called Watch Dogs. Okay. That was about hacking and all of that, kind of like an open world game. Right. right? Uh, they had access to Watch Dogs a day before it launched. Okay. <laughs> all right. Right. And because because the Russian hackers had figured out how to crack it, they had found the source files and they had put it up. Right. And uh, yeah, uh, of course, uh, that is a sketchy history. Uh so, I mean, uh, games then, uh, game uh, manufacturers and developers, all of them went into their own uh, alliances with Denuvo and other organizations, right? To go into DRM tech and stuff like that to kind of limit how quickly games could be cracked and broken up and, you know, kind right. of like um, pirated. Um, with consoles, uh, this is even more interesting. You needed to fix stuff in the discs. If you remember, because a lot of games had physical discs, Right, 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 right. So right. Uh, while the data on the disk can be copied, each disk would have some sort of a unique identifier. Right. Correct. So uh, there were processes, with especially the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 360, where you went through something called modding a console. Right. So you went to this mm -hmm. these gray markets, and there were experts who knew what to do, how to unlock it, change the chip. Uh, change the way memory was uh, transmitted. Correct. Uh, or they would disable the device's connection to the internet. Correct. Uh, so that way, there was no way to validate if your game was authentic or not. Okay. Right? So, uh, Shlomo, you could buy a AAA game for a console for as little as one dollar. Right? Uh, right. As long okay. as you knew, uh, right. as long as you knew who, who to go to to get it modded, who and where to go and pick up those games. Okay. But that changed with PlayStation Four and the Xbox One that generation because those. Uh, consoles needed access to the internet. Uh, they were natively right, right, baked right. or built with the internet in mind. Right. And you couldn't mod them. So since you couldn't mod them, the console market with regards to piracy kind of shrunk. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the PC market for piracy still continues because that has nothing to do with these kind of physical markets as much. As much as your ability to tap into you know, the various networks of crackers and hackers of games globally right so as long as you have a p2p sharing system it doesn't really matter where in the world you are okay so you can do that right uh, similarly on the other side um, uh, mobile games kind of came in right so people didn't really have to put in the effort of trying to pirate a game right okay? so since they couldn't do that kind of uh, piracy um, they didn't know how to uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, even put in the, uh, how do I put it? There's no need to go to all that effort, right? I get the uh, whatever game I want, I can figure out from plethora of catalog of free games. Never right. have to pay for any of it. And it's all in my hands, right? It's portable, it's right there. Right, okay? right, right, uh, right. And I don't have to worry about uh, 
yeah trying to hook it to a tv having to worry um because i have just one screen at home uh if my parents want to watch the tv if my parents want to watch this any of that correct they don't have to do any of that right so how do they kind of understand that mm. uh, so i'm went back to those very same markets early last year for another study to try and understand how those gray markets function and i saw all of them after the pandemic and uh, um on a working day in the afternoon when it's generally one of the busiest days for those markets all of them just lying empty right there ah uh, customers okay. hadn't shown up in months uh, pirated games collect gathering dust uh, they were trying to sell me uh, uh, what do you say uh, jacked up prices for the playstation 5 but there was nothing apart from that so all of this has kind of changed so um, what was once considered to be the land of game piracy suddenly now seems to be the land of mobile gaming right so yeah yeah that's that's interesting and that means also that uh you know where all the modernization would go from uh from microtransactions uh now in those games uh we now have the question of how microtransactions are going to work uh with um those you know hundreds of millions or you know you know of people in the global south or you know billions really at this point you know um before we we kind of do that i'm i'm uh, let's talk about the uh the culture of gaming itself right so uh or how uh mm. gaming is viewed as a as a culture um uh, is gaming as an activity viewed differently by cultures uh, in the global south uh, or is there some sort of un- uniformity uh, for example uh you know chinese and indian cultures might see gaming in one way uh you know while nigerian or brazilian cultures might uh, see things very differently um you know i mean uh, i'm thinking how uh, china's the only country where they have these super draconian laws uh designed to uh limit how much you can play right you can only play what from uh, i think uh, 8 to 9 on one weekends uh if you're under the age of 18 um yeah. and you know you got uh obviously the uh uh you know india banning pubg and i think uh, other countries yeah. have done this i think pakistan has done this maybe indonesia uh is is the concern about addiction higher in the global south uh, as a whole is the concern about gaming any any different uh so two ways to look at this lomo so you must understand um the global south has this inherent trajectory where uh, uh people in the global south um i mean see there are countries with huge populations right right correct so uh, which means that there's a lot of supply of labor and workforce and uh jobs have always been limited correct so unemployment rates are higher in these countries even though people might be qualified and have the necessary skills to find spaces uh and even uh you know with the right kinds of uh, uh going through the right kind of, i mean going to university going to college uh, getting the right kind of education doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a job right correct so uh, families are how do we put it they are always in this state of flux correct they are trying to aspire to reach the middle class correct but also the way economics works in those countries uh, you cannot stay in the middle class for long because middle class is always that ephemeral or kind of like fluid state right mm. you can't stay there uh, you either then move on from the middle class towards you know um, upper middle class and then move i know uh, that term upper middle class is very very uniquely global southian um, uh, yeah but also right uh, right since the day we are kind of born at least between my friends and my my social circles we were always conditioned of two things one um, we need to be useful to society which means we need to get a good enough job we need to do the right things pay the right amount of taxes correct we need to be considered societally successful right and that meant that we always had to get the best grades possible always had to excel in school always had to be the pick of things and yeah right? which also meant there was no time for leisure or play or anything of that mm okay correct so any time you're spending playing video games is time you're probably wasting that you could have spent probably get 
you know, that extra 1% of marks or grades that you didn't get. Right, which could mean your future, which could also mean your family's future. Uh, right. You exactly. know, it, it's interesting, though, at the same time, there is uh, potentially a lot of unemployment, though, in, even if you are unemployed, you could be spending that time looking for a way out of that. So there's just a lot more pressure in terms of that. Yeah. So yeah. now the problem is you have done this over generations. So even thinking of play as productive is a problem. Mm. So if tomorrow someone were to say, hey, I would like to build video games. Right. Imagine what the society's reaction would be. Let's talk yep. about that. Right. Yeah. So so here you are, you know, let's say, you know, uh, Aditya, you decide, you know, I, I want to make a, a lateral move here. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a professor. I, I talk about video games, but I, I want to go back to India and I want to make some video games. Uh, y what's the problem? Yeah. So uh, it'll begin with the fact that do you think there is any money in it? How are you going to make money? How are you going to find other people like you who want to make games? Right. Mm. Um, it would begin. That would be the most polite form of question. Uh, the harder questions would be to try and find somebody who is willing to fund something like this. Right. And then to be considered uh, doing so, uh, you know, societally uh, acceptable business. You're the guy who builds games that is going to ruin the future of uh, tomorrow's kids and destroy their potentials. I love right? it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you kind of look at something? I mean, I've gone through this almost all my life, right? So when I told people, hey, I want to study video games for my PhD, they were like, what exactly do you want to study? Are there not enough issues with regards to development and communication, and, uh, poverty and uh, economics? Why are you studying this? Why does it matter to you? Right. Or, oh my God, look at the privilege he comes from. He's played games all his life. So probably now he wants to study video games and see how they mattered in a country like us. Or... Has, does he have a book called Gaming Cultures in India? Are there enough cultures in India? Is there even an industry to begin with? You get my point, right? Right, so, right. And this is something that's happening across to everybody who's trying to play a game. Everybody who's spending time on a screen. You're, you're getting addicted. You're wasting your time. There's no future here. What the hell are you doing? Right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that judgmental culture is really, really big because there's so much more at stake. Absolutely. But right. That, that also means that the government has done anything but even try to understand the medium. We have no rules to regulate video games. We have no rules to regulate loot boxes. We have no rules to regulate microtransactions. And they are now in the process of trying to draft an online gaming bill, probably uh, behind every other country in the world. Um, you know, it's interesting because, of course, uh, China is the outlier when it comes <laughs> to stuff like this, right? Oh, of course, because... Uh, you must understand, Shlomo, China is also making a lot of those games. Yeah, and this is one of the interesting things uh, about this, right? Uh, where uh, I can, you know, I, I can s apply what you're saying to, to India, to much of Africa, to, you know, uh, much of South America. Um, but then there's China, who, I mean, China and India are both known for their IT sector. But China is known for game development companies and really successful ones. What what has made China so so different here? Do you think from the rest of the global so south? Their their engagement with games has always been uh, more nuanced in the sense I would give some of it to their proximity to Korea, the geographical proximity in itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And Japan, correct? Right. Even though they do not talk about it, but China is now also having some sort of their own variation of the anime industry, Chinese animation and stuff okay. like that. So right. these are things that they've always looked at, correct? And um, it's an extension of what you would call soft power, right? And mm. uh, the Chinese message and all of that. So they've viewed video games as that thing. To be honest, I think if you look at companies like Tencent or you look at companies like uh, ByteDance, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, TikTok, uh, PUBG Mobile, and all, right. probably they are the most innovating ga uh, game developers out there when it comes to mobile phones, right? So even when something like Call of Duty decided to make a sensible mobile version and they came to Call of Duty Mobile in, uh, I mean, uh, on the uh, iOS and Android ecosystems, they went to Tencent to partner up, right? They partnered up with Tencent. Uh, so you're beginning to see this. You're beginning to realize that uh, China has perfected 
how to make games profitable despite having them be free to play mm-hmm. correct and they have experimented with those systems a lot better and they look at video game development game making as a very viable uh what do you say career option uh and it's that is also something that's mimicked with the fact that some of their most popular chat platforms right like wechat and all are into game development okay uh now if you look at it with a country like india or other global south countries none of these apps or systems are being made in that country are being mm. made in these countries they're getting there but they're not at that level at which china has been at least for the last decade or decade and a half and these systems don't happen overnight okay so uh to even to think of hey i would like to make games in india between now and to actually roll out a game would be what three to four years of time okay yeah. we are seeing those nascent steps now be taken but again how successful would that be takes time right yeah uh, you begin by making copies of really popular games and then move to making novel games and experiences that takes lots of time right uh yeah and it's interesting also uh i there's only a limited amount i know about the laws that uh the govern oh. business in china but i'm assuming the laws that govern business in china are also very helpful to these companies and require you to partner uh with chinese companies and in the term, in the in the sense of let's say wechat it's also a matter of essentially making it so competitors can't really you know compete with wechat uh and in and in most of the rest of the world uh and part of that is is the censorship aspect in china uh that most Absolutely. of the rest of the world uh you know doesn't have uh which means most of the rest of the world is kind of you know more integrated together but that means also subject to the whims of uh global north companies uh, exactly perfectly said right so when you look at mobile games automatically you think of something like a rovio that makes angry birds in finland Okay. or you think of something like a game loft um or you think of any of these companies uh which are based probably in the global north trying to figure out what they're doing so you look at something like candy crush or subway surfer again mm-hmm. made by global north companies right or you look at something that you get from china and other countries in between are probably not there correct okay? so uh what you say is right i guess china the censorship is a big part of why probably china decided to build its own ecosystem for all of these things they arrived at it at their thing this is also interesting because a lot of people assume india banned pubg because of the addiction mm. but that was the smoke screen right so really because the, they, yeah the that's that's what banned, i thought yeah, yeah. no no uh, it's the same reason um. why you guys are trying to ban tiktok mm. so it's the geopolitics behind it right ah. so they banned pubg correct so because there were um there were uh, cross border tensions between india and china at the time right 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 so they went out of their way to uh, block china's most successful apps pubg I mobile see. was one of china's most successful apps so tiktok china um pubg mobile all of these were banned in that first wave and a lot of these have not come back since then um uh, t- uh, the makers of pubg did try to find an indian partner and come in which they did but then again the geopolitics plus the earlier anxieties kind of intervened and they decided to ban them again right so uh i think addiction is a smoke screen uh for the other insecurities within the global south right um but, i mean but the idea that you're wasting your time okay with... is is not a smoke screen you're saying that that is a real real co- oh, concern that is not yeah. a smoke screen. oh right, yeah right right absolutely Um I I I want to you know uh a lot of this is is really fascinating to, to, to you know to me as someone who you know has grown up with the privilege of you know taking most of this for granted you know and having the availability of you know of everything um but pretty much whenever I wanted it and uh uh You know, I th- this makes me wonder about uh, you know, a, a few things that uh, that that's going on here. Um uh, number one, is there really anything is there really anything wrong in the way game companies treat players from the global south? Do players miss out in some way from game companies? 
Uh, and I'm curious what, what your take on it is. I mean, game companies need to be realistic with regards to markets. Um, they, you know, they also need to create a level playing field for, for the game. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about things like, uh, you know, pay to win, uh, pay to win mm -hmm. would be a situation where, for example, you know, uh, given average, uh, you know, per capita income, uh, clearly the people from the global South would have a disadvantage, but of course that would be the case for the, you know, the disadvantage in every country, I guess. But uh, yeah, what 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 are your thoughts on essentially? If I'm a res if I want to if, if if I didn't know about this till now and I want to run a, a responsible uh, global video game company, what do I need to think of in terms of uh, players in the global south? Uh, I think uh, if you're thinking of integrating players from the global south. Uh, one of the biggest things you probably need to look at is, um, of course, uh, microtransactions, um, um, side-based uh, additional sources of revenue is something most game companies explore today, right? And uh, uh, when you consider something like that, you need to factor in probably uh, that the conversion rate is something that's going to hurt players in the Global South significantly. So let's take... Uh, one of the most popular games in the world, right? FIFA, the okay, football right, game, right, sure. uh, or the soccer game, uh, as uh, the US kind of knows <laughs> it. But, um, right. So, yeah, to play uh, FIFA's ultimate team, the game mode, correct, uh, um, it requires you to probably be really good at playing football and to play it at a competitive level. You also need to uh, spend money over and beyond the cost of actually buying that year's FIFA. Mm -hmm. So you... Uh, spending money uh, over and beyond the uh, retail price of the game, right. or the list price. Right. Uh, now, when you consider the in-game currency you have to buy and the conversion of it with the real world currency, the RWC, uh, you find that a lot of these conversions are in favor of people uh, who are earning in, you know, say the dollar or the pound or the euro and so on. As opposed to say somebody who's earning in, the, uh, in, in yen or probably... Uh, Yen is still much better based because Japan has always had really great ways to find of normalize their uh, yen with the dollar and other things. Okay. But say, uh, as opposed to India or Sri Lanka or Pakistan or uh, any of these countries, right? So you begin to realize that, you know, probably... So if I were to calculate it, right? So I would calculate it as a percentage of my monthly income, right? So... The amount of money I spend in, you know, microtransactions in the global south probably would be close to 15 to 20 percent of my monthly income, as opposed wow. to say one percent or two percent. Right. Yep. Right. So, uh, so you just look at that, right? So, a standard amount of purchase somebody would make is say about 12,000 FIFA points. Right now, 12,000 FIFA points is one day's salary for me in the UK. So, so but if I go back to India, where I used to work, it was ten percent of my monthly salary. So, right. So and that that's really interesting, right? So one possibility here, though, of course, it also means it, it also has to do with which uh, income bracket you are in, in those countries. I mean, you could be a very wealthy person in India, uh, right, or a very poor one, right? But we still have we still have this uh, median versus mean. Uh, distinction that we talked oh, about be, that we talked about before uh, be, before we started the show, okay. but it, it is really interesting. I'm, I'm assuming there is a downside to pricing. I mean, first of all, do microtransaction price the same uh, everywhere, uh, or do they kind make of. a kind of okay? So they don't make allowances for thinking. Uh, look, this is uh, a lower income country. Um, you know, we should essentially. Uh, lower the price for them. Um, See, ideally, that would have been perfect. But I have not seen that happen. Because right. That's brilliant, right? I mean, look at it. Look at it. I mean, there are so many uh, formulae around the world to calculate, you know, uh, what they call the PPP, right? The uh, purchase power parity and right. look at uniformity and right. stuff like that. So probably these guys, I mean, you have some of the finest accountants working for you at gaming companies. It wouldn't be that difficult. 
Well, I mean, they could, I mean, they could essentially, I mean, there's obviously, you know, the obvious way to do it is, and it's interesting because these, these are digital assets. They're not. Cool. So, right. <laughs> when we talk about purchasing power parity, <laughs> right. I mean, if, if I need to make, let's say, uh, a Big Mac, uh, you know, in the U.S. versus in, uh, let's say, Laos. Uh, you know, I'm still going to get the need to get the beef. I'm still going to need to put it together. But here I'm just talking about giving you access to a digital asset, which doesn't cost anything to produce. So potentially it could be anything. But, you know, my, you know, the the economists I'm going to hire or the team of economists are going to hire are going to tell me essentially what is going to allow me to maximize my profit. Absolutely. All right. So are we talking about uh, maximizing profit versus creating equity for, for players? Is that the, the, the questions that we're weighing? See, that is where I would begin with. You're right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So you're looking at maximizing profit, but then you're not overlooking economies of scope, right? Mm -hmm. So if your pricing was more realistic or more achievable, probably you would have a much larger player base, correct? which would probably lead to higher amounts of purchases right correct so but that is not something you look at because you have such a high barrier to entry to begin with right mm. to even consider so for, at least from my research from what i found shlomo even among the free to play people and people who look at microtransactions is in their mind they go with the assumption that we can never spend actual money okay right because mm. it's a slippery slope you cannot get out of it it's way too expensive and it'll lead to financial ruin Correct? okay so they're never willing to spend that money and uh, that's the problem because then they are technically fighting against a glass ceiling in a game almost like they're fighting in reality you, you, right? you know never... it, it let's say i find out that the culture in india right or the culture in, <laughs> in you know again let's 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 thailand let's <laughs> say Right, is such that people view the microtransactions as not worth paying for. I mean, it seems that I have uh, two two options here. Uh, number one, uh, you put in a more uh, an advertising model, right? That's that's going <laughs> to have that instead of having them pay microtransactions. Which most people are doing, right? Yeah. Which would make and an option number two is just not make the game available in that country, because otherwise <laughs> people are downloading the game using my bandwidth. Uh, or using you know using my resources and not spending yeah. money. It seems like they're just costing me money, but that seems even worse if you're a player in that country. You don't get the game at at, at all, right? Good. But again, it's it's interesting because you would think uh, whatever the market potential is, you would think that you have smart people kind of looking at least for bigger games, you know, kind of looking at no, that so and we thinking have seen this if we happen, lower the price. Right? Yeah, no, no, you're right. We have seen this kind of happen with the battle pass, for example, because the battle passes are mm. uh, or the season passes are so much more moderately priced. Correct. Right. So even if it's two pounds in the in the uh, in UK, uh, or uh, two uh, or two dollars or three dollars in the US, in India it doesn't convert to more than say two hundred or three hundred rupees, right? So uh, that's what I've seen has changed. So with games like Fortnite and PUBG and Call of Duty Mobile and Free Fire, right? People are buying those battle passes because they're affordable and they are sensible, uh, sensibly priced, correct? And they give you that uh, limited collected gear and all. So it's not right, like right. they do not want to back the game makers of the games they like. They right. Do. But they need to know that this is not something that I cannot afford. And see, if it's almost the same price as my month's rent, then right. I have to think twice. Right, right. You get my point, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sure. So, though, uh, it, though, though, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the uh, the way one would think about a battle pass is it's it's a limited time. It's you know ex you know what you're paying for. Uh, though, of course, you could pay for premium battle passes and all that stuff. But as opposed to oh, just yeah. your your regular microtransactions, you might be worried that's a slippery slope where the battle pass might not yep. be a slippery slope. Though you still have the question of how much, you know, how much it should cost based on, it's also kind of, a, yeah, th this idea of a, a level playing field, <laughs> you know, for uh, for lots of these things. Well, again, I guess uh, as long as we're not doing pay to win, you know, if all we're talking about is well, cosmetics. See, again, where, right? where are our commitments, right? Yep. So mm -hmm. if our commitment is to creating a game that is based on skill, 
when right. it's just cosmetic and collectability and stuff like that. But right. again, then there are so many games. I mean, we saw with uh, uh, what was it? Um, the uh, Diablo free to play mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Immortal, right? Diablo Immortal. It was anything but um, um, uh, skill based, right? So it was all about pay to win and right. the most aggressive kinds of pay to win. Even tiers within the battle pass and something beyond a premium battle pass. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but, right, yeah. Correct. Uh, so uh, the economics guys, the costing guys, I mean, your finance guys are always going to come up with a new form of exclusivity, which can, you can always price higher. Right. Okay? But uh, how do you then create, I mean, what does a game want? Does it want a dedicated set of players who play it every day and increase the quality of experience that other players get? Or does it want that one guy uh, who is driving his own version of a um, digital Rolls Royce in your game? Uh, what do it, you want? Well, you know, it depends on, how, you know, what's, what's obviously for many people, if I can find uh, enough whales or even one big whale to pay for my game, it's not what uh, I'm assuming if Andy was here. Clearly, Andy does not want that as a designer. He wants a bunch of people to enjoy his game. But he does, True. you know, he does have investors that are going to want, uh, no, you so, know. I mean, then you're you... probably in the wrong business, right, Lomo? Right. right? If you <laughs> wanted that one big whale, you were probably better off in investment banking. Sure, if I, if I had the skills and desire for investment banking, right? Um, no, no, I agree I, completely. Let me, <laughs> let, 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 let me ask, ask you this. Uh, one of the, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the... Um, that it's very hard to start a game company from the global south with China as as the exception here. Um, what do you think is uh, – what, what we get is that most games are made and distributed by richer nations. What do you think is lost to, to gaming, to the world if that's the case? Uh, is there an impact uh, on the world when this happens? Oh, absolutely. So uh, this uh, – um, I mean so in terms of stories and narratives, uh, the loss – in the kinds of stories we tell, the loss in the kinds of characters we build, the loss in the kinds of realities we can offer. Correct. So while video games are, yes, great places to play, but they're also places where we experience new realities, uh, understand new cultures, uh, explore new kinds of interactions and engagements. All of these are things that don't open up, right? So when you have 2 billion uh, people playing a game and all of them are exploring the streets of New York, right? Uh, Right. Correct. How many times can they do it in thousands of different worlds? You get my point, right? Yeah, um, I'm waiting for GTA 6 to, right, to, to, to see where GTA 6 takes me, right? If they come back. But yeah, you're right. right. Spider-Man and Batman and a million other games are, right, are going to take place in New York City. Yep. So hey. if all of them are going to take place there, um, it almost is like the same kind of imperialism that you know uh, major Hollywood studios were doing. Right. So how many games are willing to push that bracket to explore a new reality? So when I think of it, the first set of games that come to my mind, there's one Far Cry that was in Nepal, I think Far Cry 4. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, can you think of any other flagship games that were not set in the United States or in a country in Europe or in the UK? Even, yeah. Can you think of any of right. it's, games that yeah, come it's, to your it's, mind? It's very hard. Very, I, think, I think one of the Far Cries was in uh the caribbean right i mean you know i mean every once in a while right you have stuff like that Mm. but even if it's even you know for example the one i'm thinking about uh was in the caribbean but it was still from a western perspective and the protagonists were still americans right so yeah we're we're missing out on on all those stories and all those uh those perspectives um and i mean this is the this is why hollywood itself is Try to, you know, raise uh, diversity within Hollywood. But, of course, ideally you want diversity not within Hollywood, but within the film, the worldwide film industry and the worldwide entertainment industry. And gaming is obviously a big part of that. All right. I, I think okay. I, I'm yeah. going to ask you the final question. Absolutely. Uh, so keep it and keep it under one minute if possible. Okay. No, I'll try my best. I promise. All right. <laughs> All right, Aditya, uh, this this has been fascinating. Uh, what do you want to leave our listeners with? Okay. Uh, when you 
the next time you power up a game and the next time you probably think, hey, uh, this is something I would like to play. Do you want to think a little bit of how many of the other people you're going to encounter playing this game are going to be from the same kind of background or place that you come from? Can you imagine people playing the game you love in different countries around the world? How do you think they're doing it? Are they doing it any differently? All right. Well said, Aditya. Uh, Aditya Desbandu. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming here. All right. Good podcast. Thank GP. You. Play nice, everybody. You can subscribe and listen to all of our episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.